we need to understand some of the terms that Paul uses in his letters. I think that's really important in understanding um, what Paul was trying to convey the the mystery of the gospel that has been hidden in Christ since the before the foundations of the world. You know, and I mean that is that's the revelation that he was trying to convey. I mean, first of all, not doing away with, you know, pretense and trying to, you know, make ourselves out to be something than more than we are. Yeah, I mean, the first place is having a humble estimation of ourselves in Christ, our state, where we are at. I mean, and you, if we can't be honest with ourselves about that there's no way that we can grow you know um, I mean so we need to understand like when when he says you know he who is spiritual judges or examines in a forensic sense all things and, and he's talking about those who are spiritual, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, and I, I think he's talking about the Word of God as he's telling Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, you know, a work that doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. And when he says, You know, because, I mean, first of all, when when he says, for he who the spiritual judges or examines everything, or truly examines everything in a forensic sense, uh, all things, and yet he himself is, is uh, uh, examined or, uh, in that same forensic, you know, in a forensic sense by no man, we got to understand that, uh, first of all, Paul wasn't talking about the assembly at Corinth being uh, that spiritual person or the one having the mind of Christ, because in the very next verse in chapter 3, verse 1, and you got to understand the Greek text didn't have chapter, verse, commas. That was just one flow. So, I mean... There's, there's no actual separation of what he said in 1 Corinthians 2.16 and what he said in chapter 3, verse 1. It was like he was just continuing the thought. He said, but I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal or fleshy, even as babes in Christ. Are you not carnal or fleshy? Hey, you know, you're talking about the strife and the contentions among them. You know, and he, he says you walk as mere as men, or as the Greek implies, mere men. You know, is walk according to the flesh, as he and, and as he said in in. Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16, when he's saying, henceforth knowing no man after the flesh, he's not just talking about like what he's talking about here, but he's also talking about uh, uh, the law. And because that body of flesh is dead for a reason. You know, we're talking about circumcision that's in the flesh. He says, we don't know anyone after the flesh or according to the flesh anymore. You know, we, we got to understand that. I mean, 
that there's a wide implication of not knowing anyone after the flesh and what that term means to us in Christ so that we can get a revelation of what it is that Christ done for us so that we don't continue to put ourselves underneath the law, which is sin strength. I mean, and that is the whole idea. And also, you know, being able, as he was talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the first few verses there, you know, putting to death those fleshly deeds by the Spirit of God that's in us. But we can't do that if we still have ourselves under the law because that's sin strength. He describes that in Romans chapter 7, and he also declares it in chapter 3, verse 20, when he says, No flesh shall be justified or made righteous by the works of the law, for by the law is the knowledge, or as the Greek actually means, full discernment of sin, which he's describing in uh, chapter 7 of Romans when he says, For I had not known sin but by the commandment. So, I mean, you got to see that because in that same sense, Christ is this for righteousness. When we get a revelation of that truth that's in him that's spoken of in John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36, that, you know, if you were truly my disciples, you will remain in my word. And if you do remain in my word, you will know the truth and the truth shall make you free, you know. And we're not talking about, you know, servitude to man. We're talking about the bondage that the spirit was in to the flesh that he describes in Romans 7, 23, when he says, I see another law in my flesh waging war against the law of my mind and bringing it into captivity to the law of sin that's in my flesh. That is the, that is what the law of life that is in the spirit of Christ that made us free from that law of sin and death that he spoke of in Romans 8, 2, just a few verses later. We got to see what it is that he, that he accomplished, what, what, what all of that means to us. And we cannot know, we cannot know any of this without the Spirit of Christ. And we cannot have the Spirit of Christ in us unless the body is dead because of sin. Romans 8.10. I mean, and this, I mean, this is, this is, I'm going to mention this every time because unless you planted yourself into Jesus Christ and into his death through water baptism, you do not know him. And there is no way that you can please him because the spirit of him, the one true God in Christ, does not dwell in you unless the body is dead because of sin, as he said in Romans 8.10. But now our spirit is alive because of the righteousness that he imparts to us apart from the law, as he describes in Galatians 3, you know, the scripture can find everyone under sin, that the promise may be given to those who believe. You know, as he says in another place, that the that the promise may be sure to all of the seed. You know, so that we're made righteous, not upon any act of our own. So we're not trying to grow out of sin. This, I mean, it's the whole point of the scripture that Paul, the mystery of the gospel, the, the good news of Jesus Christ. We're not trying to grow out of sin. We're just growing up in him. We done circumcised ourselves with the circumcision of Christ. Being baptized into him, we put off the body of the old man, the body of sin. You know, so we got to, so to be spiritual, you know, is... To come into that maturity, you know, and you can't, you cannot do it 
if you do not humble yourself, if you do not have a humble estimate of yourself, you know, instead of a self-exalted, uh, self-proclamation of yourself, You know, the, the faith that calls those things that be not as though they were, that is him enabling us beyond ourselves. You know? Beyond our ability. He gives us supernatural ability. That's why he says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, do you know, and you know, some saying they're a Paul, another Paul is whatever, and they're striving, you're envy, and all this. He says, Are you not carnal and walk as men? Or fleshy, fleshly, and walk as men? You know, learning as that's why he's saying in Galatians 5 16, I say them walk in the spirit, and you will not carry out or fulfill the evil desires of the flesh I mean that's those I mean they really go hand in hand what he's talking about here the conflict among them it's what James was talking about whence come wars and fightings among you do they not come from your members and he's not talking about a bot a group of body he's talking about the same thing that Paul's talking about in Romans 7 23 I mean, no doubt James had heard, understood that principle. The, the fightings and wars come from our members, our flesh. It's not talking about, it's not talking about, you know, conflict because of a group of people. No, he's talking, you know, that don't even make no sense. What does make sense is the, the fightings and the wars and struggling to have and have and not coming from our flesh, the fleshly desires for selfish ambition, you know. And we understand the revelation of that when James says that and we say, oh, okay. Well, now it's a, dependent upon each individual themselves doing their part. As, as you know, and Paul describes, you know, the the body, you know, and and when Christ ascended, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Severally, as they will, and not everyone is given the same gift, and not everyone is given the same measure. And I don't care what anyone says, because that is not true, because Jesus, when he's talking about the talents, is talking about the same thing. He might give one person one talent. He might give another person two talents. And he might give another person ten or five talents. But he expects an increase from that person severally as he has measured or dealt to him that ability in the spirit. And, you know, and when he's talking about you know, if, if if one is not the hand, and he's like he's wanting to be the hand, but he's not the hand. He says, "Is he not therefore of the body?" And I'm telling you, I've already seen this vision. People trying to be something that they are not in Christ, so that there is deformity in the body. People don't even recognize. Their deformity. They're walking around all happy and and joyful, and they don't even know what they don't even realize that in in the in the spirit they're deformed. You know, you know. And the Lord gave me this vision. I mean, back in my youth of of seeking the true faith and and seeking God diligently and fasting and praying and 
and and wanting to I was hungry and thirsting after righteousness. I wanted to follow the true faith. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Know you not your own self? How that Christ be in you because you're one spirit with him unless you be rejects or reprobates. I mean, so we need to understand that. But, you know, an angel of the Lord was taking me into this building and really, it looked like it looked like a prison, an old-fashioned prison, a dungeon with doors, with steel doors and metal bars. And he warned me. He says the people behind this door are are, are grossly disfigured. And I was like, I want I want to see because in this, I, the, it started out. I was I was talking with two men by a boat by a lake about the true faith and two men from behind me from from some trees back there behind me just uh you know uh not dense trees just like one here and there but they were like they were calling me over saying come follow us in the true faith and as i followed and i followed them then i was i met this I met this angel. So I'm giving context to this dream. And as Paul, whenever he was uh, saw in a dream, the two men bidden him to come to a certain city and he went. And, you know, he was, that was by the spirit of the Lord. Well, in this dream, the answer to my prayer, as the angel opened the door to this room, some of these people were so sorely disfigured that they couldn't even walk upright. Uh, heads were where legs should have been, or or legs were arms where a head should have been. And I mean I had, and they were just walking around, smiling, totally oblivious to their state. And as soon as we walked in, a a woman, really sorely disfigured with uh, legs and arms in wrong places, and and greeted me just smiling not not even aware of her condition and I I moved I didn't say anything to her and I moved on past and I was looking around and I mean one so sorely this figure just kind of crawling around on the ground and they're not and they're oblivious to their state you know people trying to take a position in the spirit that they do not belong in. Why Paul says, whatever your calling is, he says, Wait on that. You know, and, and I've, I've used this before because when King, when David was just a little shepherd boy and God told Samuel to go to Jesse and he had four sons, David being the, the youngest, told him to go and uh, anoint one of his sons as king and he wouldn't know him until he stood in front of him well jesse didn't bring david he was out keeping the sheep you know the, the same one that came out and slew goliath the one that you know said you know i slew the lion and the bear when they came after my father's sheep uh this man of faith the one who God said, this is a man after my own heart. And 
Jesse brought his other sons before him. Is like Samuel was like, was this, are these all your sons? Because the spirit did not give witness to neither, none of them. They said, well, there's an there's another boy, a lad, keeping the sheep. He said, well, bring him before me. And as soon as he came before him, you know, he knew that this was the one. And, and Samuel anointed David as king. But David didn't try to fulfill that. He went, he, he went back to life as usual, tending his father's sheep. And then later, killing Goliath. Well, Saul was still king. You know, the, the, the one who wrote the psalm, Touch not mine anointed, neither do my prophets any harm. You know, uh, when, when, when Saul was pursuing after him to kill him, and he dared not to raise his sword against God's anointed. Because Saul was anointed as king. And he wasn't trying to fulfill that in his, in his own power. He was waiting upon the Lord. As, as the scripture says out of uh, Isaiah, was it 40.31 or 41.31? He says, you know, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know, it's about waiting on him. It is about, you know, you know, James and, and, and Jude talked about those who were sensual, not having the spirit. You know, uh, don't don't mistake the senses of the flesh for what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. The strong meat belongs to those who are of full age, who by reason of use, what he just got through talking about the milk, and that's what Paul is describing in in First Corinthians thirteen and fourteen, the milk of the word. You know, or we prophecy in part, we know in part, we have the knowledge, you know, the gift of knowledge in part. But when that, is, which is perfect, and that, that's the same Greek word, full age, in Hebrews 5.14. And uh, we've got to see that. And the same one used uh, the second time King James renders in Philippians 3, you know, but you who are... are Perfect is actually full age, mature, you know, be thus minded. You know, it was the first time Paul says, I don't I don't count myself to have attained, and talking about the resurrection, neither were made perfect. He's talking about something completely different. He's talking about the changing of our physical body from the from the natural to the spiritual, which is not going to happen until Christ comes. You know, when the trump, when the last trump sounded. You know. You know, when we gotta. I mean, we need to we need to understand some of the terms that he's using: spiritual, the mind of Christ, the. You know, because saying that we have the mind of Christ when we don't have the mind of Christ and we're all carnal and we hardly know the word of God, you know, you can't, come, you can't claim to be spiritual. It is the word of God that transforms us. You know, Hebrews 4.12 talks about the word of God being living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword dividing asunder soul and spirit. And I believe that means distinguish between soul and spirit. That is, you know, discerning, you know, one of the senses of discerning between good and evil, you know, uh, being able to discern Christ in us, being able to hear his voice, you know, 
and that only happens as as the flesh is put to death and it is given life and it's sanctified and it's purified by the washing of the water by the word as he tries to describe in, in Ephesians 5:26 you know as he says in 1 Corinthians 15:36 and I've and I quote that a lot is like the body you sow is not given life unless it dies and that's what he's talking about that purification that sanctification you know that he the writer of Hebrews in 9 uh, chapter 9 verses 13 and 14 you know describing the sanctification and purification of the flesh by Old Testament scrap, uh, sacrifices, you know, the, if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, you know, sanctify to the purification of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Jesus, who through the Holy Spirit gave himself as the atoning sacrifice for our sin, purge our minds from evil works, to serving the living God. But now, since, as you know, as Peter said, it's not a matter of, you know, washing away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a clear conscience towards God. And Paul was constantly talking about, you know, those strong in the faith bearing the weakness of those weak in the faith so they didn't cause a stumbling block in front of them to uh, defile their conscience. You know, because whatsoever is not a faith is sin. Romans 14, 23. I mean, we need to, I mean, we just need to get a, a, a humble, accurate, true uh, understanding of some of these terms. I mean, so that we can grow up in him. I mean, you know, when he talks about, um, uh, you know, for I bear witness, and is talking about it in Romans, I forget which chapter, but he says, I bear witness to my brother who, who have a form of the knowledge and the truth, and knowledge and that truth that is in Christ. Because Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 7, some are ever learning and ever able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And it's the same Greek word used for knowledge, full discernment, when he's talking to Timothy as he is here in Romans, a knowledge that is that same full discernment, that same Greek word, and of the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We, I mean, we need to understand that form, that figure, that type, that shadow, because when he told Moses, see to it, when he was building the temple and the things of the temple and all of the furniture, he said, see to it that you pattern it, make it after the pattern that I showed you in the mount. The form, the figure, the, the type, the shadow of the true, as the writer of Hebrews said, those things had to be sanctified by blood, but the the figures the you know the types but the heavenly things themselves with better and that is the, the sacrifice of jesus christ i mean so we gotta when he's talking about a form of the knowledge of the truth or we're talking about being spiritual or as he told the galatia uh church or the assembly uh, uh galatia in chapter 4, verse 19, you know, my little children who I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. You know, I mean, these things, I mean, it's, everyone is so bent and focused on, you know, earthly blessings. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all those things will be added. But everyone is is too caught up with their mind being the word of God being choked and prevented from bearing the fruit. You know, as we talked about in the parable of the sower, 
You know, I mean, as he said in Colossians 3, verses 1, 2, and 3, he says, If you therefore be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. You know, set your affections on the things above. And that word in King James translated affections is the same Greek word that is translated mind in Romans 8, 5, and 6. For those who are after the flesh, mind the things of the flesh. For those who are after the spirit, mind the things of, of the spirit. He's talking about setting the affections of the mind on. And that's the same thing he's talking about in Colossians verse 2. Where he says, set your the affections of your mind on the things above and not the things below. For you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Talking about in the Holy Spirit, whom we have been sealed by. Who is the down payment the of the purpose purchase possession because God purchased us with the life of his son I mean we got to see that we are sealed with him and as long as we Offer our bodies as living sacrifices through the faith of him. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. I mean, we got to... This is true in our life if we're living by the faith. And what is that faith that I am crucified and Christ lives in me? That, that is the circumcision of Christ and putting off the old man, the body of sin, and, and putting on the new man. And it's the power of God's word. You know, people need to turn off secular radio, turn off their secular TVs, and quit crowding out the word of God. I mean, because that is exactly what it is doing. The parable of the sower and the thorns. He says, you know, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things. I mean, there's three categories of things here. I mean, you can get caught up in anxieties over how, how am I going to take care of this and how am I going to take care of that? And Paul is talking about contentment. He said, I'll learn in whatever state that I am in Philippians to be content. You know, for that is just, you know, having faith in God that he, he cares for us. He cares for us. He said, I have learned to abound and I have learned to suffer lack. You know, and you know, gain is not godliness. But godliness with contentment is great gain, as Paul said. And in Philippians chapter 3, he says, you know, talking about those who mind earthly things. Here goes that same Greek word again. Those who have their affections of their minds set on earthly things, whose God is their belly. Who mind earthly things. Who set the affections of their mind on earthly things. You know... I mean, we've got to... We've got to see some of the terms that Paul used but you know some of these some of these modern translations are just they mutilate that and that's just Satan's doing you know you don't need 
an easy read translation. Get you, get a King James and get a Strong's. And I'll tell you what, even some of the, Get the 1611 authorized because even some of the even some of the newer copyright King James versions are like they're like removing this, removing that, and you go you go into uh, uh, Hebrews chapter five verse eleven where it says, "For you have become dull of hearing." Well, the newer translations have omitted "become dull of hearing." And that's exactly what happens if you, if you keep on reading. Become dull of hearing is the way it should read, and taking it out takes away discernment from from the believer to be able to understand what's going on, because he's talking about the same kind of person in Mark chapter four, you know, where he says, "You have ears to hear." You know, if you have an ear to hear and a willingness to listen, pay attention to what I'm saying. Whatever measure you use to listen, it will be measured back to you and more shall be given to you. But you that have not a willingness to hear, even what you previously had, understood, seen, perceived, shall be taken from you. You know, and that is exactly what the writer of Hebrews is describing in chapter 5, verse 11. He says, you know, talking about the uh, Jesus, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, without beginning or ending of days, and not after the order of Aaron. He said, we have so many things that we want to tell you, but hard to be put into words or uttered, seeing you become dull of hearing. But some of the modern translations just take that become out, since you were dull of hearing. And that is not it. These, and it's talking about a, a, a willingness to listen and a laziness and just... A hardness, you know, that uh, we need to understand some of these things. I mean, so that we can, so that we can make sure that we keep ourselves out of that trap. You know, His Word is a lamp unto our feet. You know, and it is health to our flesh. You know, so we, I mean, we got to see that the, uh, man, most of these newer translations are just Satan putting his, putting his foot in everyone's life, you know, twisting and corrupting God's word, you know, and all it takes is just a little place. Second, Paul says, give no place to the devil. You know, it's, when you you look at the Greek word translated place, it's like a wedge. Because once Satan can get the tip of that wedge into a crack, he can drive it in. Look at the woman. He, when he, when he's, here's how he approaches her. Because God said, you know, don't eat of the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Or dying, you should surely die. That's, that's the literal rendering of, rendering of the Hebrew. And here's Satan. This is the way he approaches it. Has God truly said you can't eat of any of the trees? See, I mean, that's not even a legitimate question. You know, a, leg, a legitimate question is good because we, we, are, we are desiring to, to grow in the truth. But that's not a legitimate question. That's just... That's just a way in to to start beguiling, you know. So I mean, we need to. I mean, we just that's what Paul was talking about in Second Corinthians eleven. You know, I I fear lest you know Satan 
as Satan beguiled Eve in the garden so that your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And that Greek word translated simplicity, don't let, because I've seen that word used in totally different ways than what Paul was intending it, because it's talking about the simplicity, talking about sincerity, talking about without pretense. And he's talking about the law. He's talking about these super apostles, you know, that have come in amongst them and trying to bring them back into bondage to the law. That's why he says, for I have espoused you to one husband, you know, that I might present you as chaste virgins unto the Lord. You know, I mean, we need to really understand that. I mean, because that's what he's talking about in Romans chapter 7, verse 4. You know, consider yourselves dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even to him who has risen from the dead. You know, so I'm, we need to, I mean, really need to pay attention to some of the things Paul is talking about because, you know, in the process of talking about faith for things, you know, we're, we're neglecting our spiritual growth. You know, it's just distractions, smoke and mirror, you know, divide and conquer everyone wanting to, well, that's not what it that means to me. And, and, you know, it doesn't matter. Peter said, scripture is of no private interpretation, but holy men of God wrote it as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote the commandments of God. He didn't write his opinion. You know, that's what he was talking about in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I think it is, when he says, and maybe 7, I, he says, you know, for I suffer not a woman to, to teach nor usurp authority over the man. He says, what, the word of God came out from you only, or, you know, he says, if anyone among you thinks himself spiritual or a prophet, let him consider this, that the things that I write are the commandments of the Lord. And if anyone choose, you know, be ignorant of what he just said about women not teaching nor usurping authority over man, he says, let them be ignored. If anyone choose to ignore this commandment that I'm giving you, let them be ignored. You know, the King James renders it, if anyone be ignorant, let them be ignorant. But that's not the correct rendering of that. It's talking about ignorance. It's just like First Corinthians or Second, yeah, First Corinthians fifteen thirty-four, where it says. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God, or some are ignorant of God. He's not talking about ignorance. He's, he's talking about ignoring. If anyone chooses to ignore this, let them be ignored, which keeps with Paul's whole concept of, you know, if anyone does not walk according to the traditions we have taught you not to keep company with them. I mean, it's just a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You know, I mean, we got a, we got a holiness separation, you know, and I mean, we got to get a hold of it. We got to get a hold of it. Because if we live according to the flesh, we will die. But if we, through the Holy Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body, we shall live. Romans 8, 13. And guess what he follows right up with that in verse 14. Those led by the Spirit of God are the ones born of God. It's rendered children, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't say, it's not talking about sex. It's talking about offspring. It's talking about one born of, you know, and those led by the Spirit of God are born of God. And it's just, it's that simple. I mean, as he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 36, 
the body you sow is not going to be given life unless it dies. It's got to die every day. That's why he says in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, because that is the only way that we do it is by his mercies. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, you know, let us become, come boldly before the throne of grace that we find, may find mercy and grace to help in time of need. He says, by the mercies of God, to offer your body as a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service, that you may prove what is his good, acceptable, and perfect will. You know? I mean, we, we can't even know that unless we're putting our body to death. And that means the pride and the arrogance. You know? Having a humble estimator, estimation of ourselves. And not, we don't choose. We do not choose what and who we are in Christ. We do not choose that. And, and I think that really needs to be stressed in the body of Christ. We do not choose our calling. And the gifts and calling of God are without repentance, without change. You don't start off as one thing and become something else. That is not the way that it works. So, and whatever your calling is, as Paul said, wait. Wait. You know, and I had this dream. Soldiers everywhere and they're they were held up behind their their uh, barricades and their sandbags and they're they're waiting I said what are these they said they're waiting for the command to go to battle so they're waiting You know, and, and we need to they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and they shall not be weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint. Because as Paul said in Galatians 5, 16, he said, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill or carry out the evil desires of the flesh. And in verse 18, if you be led by the spirit, you're under no law. That means you're under no condemnation. And guess what? Romans 8, 14, those that are led by the spirit of God are the ones born of God. I mean... I mean, as believers, we need to start putting all of this stuff together. I mean, it is time to grow up. Because the time is drawing close, man. The time is drawing close. Hear the Spirit of the Lord. Hear what He says. I tell you the truth, it is coming. Amen.